75 years after the end of the Holocaust, 31% of all Americans believe that 2 million or fewer Jews were killed in the Holocaust. Among young Americans, 66% of them could not identify Auschwitz as a concentration camp or death camp. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, after a trip to a concentration camp in April 1945, wrote, I made the visit deliberately in order to be in position to give firsthand evidence of these things if ever in the future there develops a tendency to charge these as allegations and that they are propaganda. Today, 80 years after the outbreak of World War II and 75 years after the end of the Holocaust, the Pasuk from Parashat HaZinu is more timely than ever. Zachor Yemot Olam, remember the days of old. Sha'ala Vicha Viagedcha, ask your father and he will tell you. This is the last generation that has the privilege to hear the survivors' testimonies firsthand. You are the direct beneficiaries to hear these firsthand testimonies. In addition, when living history becomes a memory, it will be you, the students who participated in Names Not Numbers, through your documentary, you will remember the days of old, Zohor Yemot Olam. The survivors and the students are telling the story of the Holocaust for the world to hear, for the world to learn, and to inspire future generations to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred and intolerance. Our Names Not Numbers students are learning history, recording history, and preserving history through their work. Life was good. I thought it would be like this forever. My uh, childhood ended when I was four years old when the Luftwaffe came in and bombed up Belgium. They made my parents work and I was left in the barrack. And my mother always said, don't go near the barbed wire. By the day or so into the bomb shelter, a huge artillery shell penetrated the entire building. If it didn't explode, if it exploded, it would have vaporized us. Tinder transport was very scary because I didn't know where I was going or who I was going to see and where I was going to live. And I just imagined the worst. Today, we are at the Holocaust Learning Center, and we are here to have our opening day for our Names Not Numbers program. Today with Rabbi Weisberg, first we got to see a video of the Names Not Numbers project from a few years back, and then he showed us a video explaining a lot of stuff that happened during the Holocaust. And he stopped at certain intervals to go deeper on it and ask questions about it. Because when you talk about the Holocaust, it's a six million piece jigsaw puzzle. But there's so much we still are exploring because we're still putting this jigsaw puzzle together. There's so much still that we don't know. And much of what we don't know is the six million stories. So Names Not Numbers, we spend a few weeks learning about the Holocaust, just getting some more background information, and then we get split into groups and we get assigned a survivor. The survivor, we're going to interview them. Today is the official opening of the Names Not Numbers program for the 2022-2023 school year. The 20 of you are going to be a part of a unique program that will require you to take on the awesome responsibility of making sure that these survivor stories will never be forgotten 
and the atrocities of the Holocaust will also never be repeated. I decided to do names on numbers because I think it's important to learn firsthand what happened from Holocaust survivors. I think it's important to interview Holocaust survivors because then we could like pass on their stories to other generations and tell others that it was true and everything actually happened. I think that it's really important that we keep talking about the Holocaust so we can assure that it doesn't happen again. The Nazis put numbers on the Jews' arms and like made them like their identity was just like oh number 24 or something and instead of like names like names are very significant and I feel like that's what the Nazis took away from them. In names and numbers you get to talk and meet with a Holocaust survivor so it's you get to know them with their name and not just as one of the many people who died in the Holocaust. When you use someone's name, you are truly seeing them for who they are, right? It'd be very different if I was trying to organize these students over here at this table in order of height, and I said, uh, you over here, you, you go to the left. But if I said their names, I'm recognizing who they are as human beings. Right? And that's exactly what the Nazis were trying to take away from the Jewish people and many others. And you guys are the living testimony to the fact that that failed. The people who are going to pass on the stories of the Holocaust survivors once they're all gone are going to be the children of the Holocaust survivors and us who got to hear their story firsthand. What moved me the most to apply to this program is that my great-grandparents, who me and my brother are named after, um, were Holocaust survivors, but I never got the chance to talk to them because they passed away before I was born. We got to actually see a replica of Anne Frank's room, which was really cool to see the area she had to hide in for two years. Something I learned today was how small Anne Frank's room was. When I went into that room, I could not imagine myself in that situation, and I feel really bad about what she went through. Michael Behar talked with us about some techniques when interviewing and I learned a lot about even to nod your head to show that you're interested. What you guys are going to do with this program is really special and I can't understate that. You're going to get an experience to meet a Holocaust survivor. You're going to actually get to interact with one and film their life story and that is an honor that very few people will ever get to have. Make them comfortable Talk to them nicely, talk to them loudly, talk to them with a smile. It's really important. Once they start answering, the most important thing I could tell you today in all the years and all the thousands of interviews I've done that I could tell you is to nod your head throughout the interview. Because that's how you're gonna keep a person engaged. It's not just about what you say in the questions. You really want to be a great listener. In fact, that's really more important than even asking the question. So we're going to have uh, three cameras. Both of these cameras are going to be focused on the, on the survivor. The third camera is going to be around here. So this camera is going to be like kind of like the behind the scenes camera. I remember we learned this rule about thirds, like in the camera. So you're going to have you're going to split the screen into three, vertically and horizontally. And you always want to keep the subject's eye line in between where two lines meet. And you want to put them on the side of the screen, sort of looking off onto the side as if they were talking to someone. We're going to use medium shot, close-up shots, and then wide angle shots. A close-up, if it's in a person, it's going to show a little bit of the shoulders up. And you can get even a little bit closer like to their eyes. It's going to be showing the waist so up, that's considered a medium shot. A wide shot or establishing shot, the behind the scenes camera is gonna have a wide angle. So they're gonna have a sense of where the interview is happening. When I was using the professional camera, it felt different because it's way different than using a camera like on your phone. Because you can like zoom in and like focus it like while you're recording and focus on like the main thing that you want to video. I feel like my grandfather would probably feel really proud and happy that I'm filming because my family never really got the chance to record any of the stories. We have many stories, but we were never able to really record or capture them in like a, through video. 
when I'm about to interview the Holocaust survivor, I'm probably going to feel very nervous but excited at the same time because I would really love to hear their story but nervous because I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable because it's like my first time hearing this story from them. I'm really excited for my interview because I get to know about my survivor and his story. I'm excited because I want to get to like learn about the Holocaust survivor's story and like how they experienced the Holocaust. My name is Rhody Glass. I was born April 26, 1936 in Amsterdam. Amsterdam was a lovely city where everybody was accepted. The Jews lived very much as part of the population, were not discriminated against. So I always remember it being a very nice place to live. My father was trained as a tailor, as a young boy. My mother was born in London. My grandfather started businesses and when my father married my mother, they all worked in the family business. My name is Ralph Mollerick. I was born May the 27th, 1930, in Kassel, Germany. My hometown was actually Wolfhagen, where I lived with parents and grandparents in a small town about a population about 7,000, and out of that 7,000 people, about 100 were Jews. My father had a big business, and the farmers used to bring the wheat to him for storage, and then he would sell it to the bakers. My mother worked with my father in the business, and I have one sibling, an older sister. She's eight years older than me. My current name is Alan John Hall. April of 1935 in Krakow, Poland. I remember living in a nice house with my mother and dad. Uh, my grandparents lived about a block down the street, same street, and we lived a very comfortable, quiet lifestyle. My dad was one of the youngest of six children. He was an insurance adjuster. The Polish insurance companies would not hire a Jewish person. So he got a job with an Italian insurance company. My mother was a professional violinist. My name is Eric Lippitz. I was born in Antwerp, Belgium, 31st of October, 1936. Well, the war started when I was four years old, so <clears throat> I really don't remember too much before that, except that I had a very good life and uh, we had a nice home. I have two older brothers. Uh, one is, my oldest brother was four years older than me. My middle brother was about 15 months older than me. And uh, life was good. I thought it would be like this forever. Well, we had uh, aunts and uncles uh, living in, in the general area. It was, a, I believe, a Jewish neighborhood in general. <clears throat> my father is uh, he originally from Lithuania, and he went to Liège, a very prestigious university in Belgium. But he got involved in quite a few different businesses among uh, a little bit on diamonds, a lot on bristles, which is the hair from animals that was used for hairbrushes and paintbrushes. I do remember my father talking about that uh, horrible fellow in Berlin who looked like Charlie Chaplin, uh, but was talking about him, uh, him just taking all the Jews and uh, getting rid of them. If people said anti-Semitic thoughts, I don't think we were too much aware of it, you know? Nobody told, called us dirty Jew or we were not, al not allowed anywhere. We were accepted, as you are here in this country right now. But in retrospect, that might have been an illusion. My father wasn't afraid of Nazism because he felt that he was a good citizen there were a lot of industries, like for example, banking, where a Jewish person just would not be hired. 
My dad couldn't get a job that he wanted in any Polish company. The schools um, were trying to hide that a little bit, but we were seated in the back row of an auditorium all the time, never up front, never in the middle. We were separated, obviously a sign of anti-Semitism. There was a little girl in our building and she and I would play all the time. I remember one time we were in her apartment and she started looking at me in a very harsh way, scowling at me and looking at me for long periods of time. And I, I didn't do anything wrong, I knew that. It's no different than all the other days. And finally, she said, but kind of half yelled, get out of here, get out of here, you dirty Jew. Well, I was, I didn't know what to do. And nobody's ever talked to me that way. And so I figured the best thing to do is back, go back home. That was the last time that little girl and I played together. The baker would uh, say, there's no bread for you today. And he'd be turned away obviously because we were Jews. And uh, Judaism was feared from the Nazis. Jews did this and Jews did that and caused this and caused that to happen. For example, the big depression was blamed on the Jews. The war was imminent and everybody, everybody pretty much knew it. You could see people taken into the streets and they were taken away by truck. When my grandfather was taken, the family decided it was time to move to a large city. The date the war began, which was the 1st of September of 1939, uh, all hell was breaking loose. Food was getting scarce because uh, from 1933 to, to the outbreak of the war, supplies went to the military. What was left over went to the people. The Nazi party was in total control. They could pass any laws they wanted to, and rationing, of course, had a start. We could only get so many eggs, so many so much butter. Last time I saw my parents is when the kinder transport took place. The kinder transport was a rescue mission uh, started by a Jewish group in England who knew that children were being slaughtered. They sent, set up trains to take people out from big uh, cities to the dock, which was in Holland the children were not allowed to come with parents. So we came alone as kids from five to 17, that was the range. Kinder transport was very scary because I didn't know where I was going or who I was going to see and where I was going to live. It was total blank in my mind and I just imagined the worst. My remembrance of what that was like was by being torn away from parents and grandparents, put on a train. No one told me why. They just said, you're gonna leave. How am I supposed to deal with that? The last thing that was said to me, my mother went first and talked to my sister named Edith, who was at that time 17 years old. Here's a prayer book. Ta say prayers for us because we don't know when and where we will meet again. My father turned to me and said, son, get an education for that something no one can take away from you. Those were the words that I left with. Never saw my parents again. On the train, uh, they told us to pull down the shades so no one could see in or look out. What I remember of the train, I wanted a book. And I asked if I can ask my parents for that book. And my older sister said, you can't have that. Just sit down and pay attention. There's no time for that sort of thing. 
And that's when I really felt scared that I couldn't even have a book that I, that my favorite uh, comic book, for example. And there was a guard, an armed guard on that train that took us to Holland. And anybody that spoke out, he was on their backs immediately. And I looked at the, behind the screen to see what was outside. Maybe I could see my parents. He told me, don't ever do that when I tell you to pull down the shade, you pull it down, you don't look. And so I just sat next to my sister and didn't say another word till we got to Holland. The Netherlands were invaded in 1940 and we were told by the police that we had to keep our shades down and we weren't allowed to look out. So we were all standing in our store, one of our stores, the whole family. And we were peeking, they were peeking out of the shades and they saw the Germans goose stepping by. When the Germans had been in, in, in Holland for about a year, they formed a Jewish committee called the Yotzerat. It's called the Jewish Committee. And it com comprised of um, lawyers, the head of the bank, the head of the diamond business, so-called prominent people. The Germans would give them rules against the Jews and the undesirables. First rule was the worst rule because they had told the Jews, the Dutch Jews from the whole country, that they had to register with the Jewish committee. So now you go and you give them your name and your address. So now they knew where we all were, like fish in a barrel. There were a small, small minority who was smart enough not to do that. And then came the rules that you're not allowed to go to schools, you're not allowed to have bicycles, and bicycle to this day is the largest mode of transportation in the Netherlands. You're not allowed to go to the movies, you're not allowed to go to parks, you're not allowed to go to restaurants, you have a curfew, you can only shop in certain stores. Now this was not for everyone, although, as I said before, the whole country was occupied, this was Jewish rules. And in 1942, they did the uh, rule that every Jew had to wear a Jewish star. Today, I wear a star all the time, but not because I have to, because I want to. The Jews had to hand in all their valuables Valuables being money, jewelry, Shabbat candles, whatever they had that was of value to the Germans. My grandfather, who was the head of our family, you know, my mother's father was the head of the family. Supposedly, he handed in all his money and all his everything. And for my fifth birthday, my grandfather bought me a bike, a bike. I only had the bike for a couple of days because the Germans took it away. My fifth birthday was special because it was in 1941 and the Germans had already occupied the Netherlands and my mother made a beautiful birthday party for me. Big profiteroles and the whole family was there. And it's the last birthday I remember where my whole family all my aunts and uncles, nieces and cousins were together. My father uh, felt that war was coming. He thought it was going to be very difficult to escape from Belgium. Uh, nobody wanted Belgian money. Uh, gold doesn't go anywhere because it's too heavy to carry. You can't bribe your way through. Silver was bulky and uh, awkward to carry. It was only one thing that's going to help you to escape from Belgium to go to another country. It's this, about this big. Do you know what I'm talking about? Diamonds. Belgium, and especially Antwerp, was the capital of the diamond industry. My father had a, a few friends in the business, and my father went to one of them and said he wanted to buy a handful of diamonds. My father bought some of the diamonds. He went to the bank and put them in a safe deposit box. Uh, my uh, childhood ended when I was four years old when the Luftwaffe came in and bombed uh, Belgium. What happened? The Nazis invade. We made a mad dash out of the country, trying to get out of the country. And my father realized not going anywhere without the diamonds. He took my oldest brother 
went back to our house in Antwerp, and believe it or not, the house was still standing. All around us, the houses were burning and everything. My father got my brother well-dressed. They went on the trolley, and they went right into the heart of Antwerp. And he, they got off the trolley, full of Nazi soldiers all over the place. And they're looking at him, you know what's going on? They're the only ones on the trolley. And my father said, you know, I had a choice to make right there and then, either to run away and I'd be caught or shot, and my oldest son would be shot, or to try to get through to out talk them. He walked right to where the Nazis were standing. He says, ach, a guten Tag, how are you? Welcome to Belgium. You know, now we'll have some order in Belgium. So glad you're here. And you know, we live right down the road. He gave a false address. He said, you must come and have a schnapps with us. So they, it's one of ours, you know, the Nazis were very nice to him and he kept going, went to the bank, went down to where the safety deposit boxes was <clears throat> and he took out the diamonds, went outside. Who's standing there? About a dozen or six or seven, I don't remember exactly. Gestapo agents. My father walked right over to them and pulled the same bit. Ach, a guten Tag, how are you? Tell me, he said, we usually go to Berlin every summer to, for the Wagner Festival, for Beethoven, and uh, what's going on this summer? You know, because of the wars, are you going to have concerts again? And they're looking at him and say, oh yeah, yeah, you, you have to come again. It's my father said, I plan to come but uh, don't start arresting me every time I come over. He said, no, you're not a Jew. And I first said, you're darn right I'm not. My father told me in later years he was never so scared in his life. He pulled it off, though. He pulled it off. My mother and dad started arguing. Now, I have never before heard them argue. The gist of the argument was, he said we need to leave Krakow and go further east. Mom said, he, that she didn't agree with him and she wanted to stay put. She thought Germans were educated, cultured pe people and this, this war was not going to touch us. And Dad said, you know, Hitler makes it very clear what he thinks about Jews and what he wants to do with Jews. This argument went back and forth until finally Dad grabbed me by the hand and started pulling me out the door. And my mother was shocked. She said, what are you doing? What, what, what's going on here? And Dad said, if I can't convince you to go to Lvov, I'm taking the boy, her only child, and we're going to Lvov. Well, at that point, she was not going to let, she was not going to let him take her child. So she, over tears, decided to come with, with us. We started walking across. Well, we looked for a, for, for buses, we looked for any mode of transportation. The railroads were bombed out, the roads were being strafed and bombed. We uh, wound up walking from Krakow to Lubav. And so we'd, night, we'd knock on somebody's door and ask for shelter and food. Some people were very generous and gave us both and let us sleep in the house. And other people said, well, you can sleep in a barn. We came to a river what we did not know is when we came to that river, that was the dividing line between Soviet Union and, and Nazi Germany. Everything east of there, Soviet Union took over. Everything west of there, Nazi took over. All the bridges were bombed out, and the only thing that was available was a, a barge. We got on our barge, got in the back, pushed us across the river, and now, unbeknownst to us, we're in a Soviet part of Poland. Well, the Soviets, they had nothing against Jews. So then we walked to Lvov, and we all wound up having an apartment, and he had a job, and life went back to normal. We went from Germany to a, a port where a ferry was stationed, and that ferry was to take us across the channel to England. All of us got off the train at once. All of us were rushed on this ferry all of us slept on benches overnight, and the following morning, uh, we were in a port, and that port had buses, and that buses to a, took us to a summer camp, but this was December, very cold, 
and the bunk houses had no heat. The camp had an arrangement. Every Sunday, you get dressed up in your best clothes. I only had one good pair of clothing at that point. And it felt like, uh, like a market, like people were looking you over, looking to see if you would fit in, that, in their family and so forth. Just picture standing at a platform on a, on a railway station and people coming over, looking you over, see which child they want to take and possibly be a foster parent to or even adopt. And uh, one family came forward and had one son, a little bit younger than me, and uh, they had a house and they took good care of me. My mother put me to bed and my parents were sitting down to relax for a few minutes and there was this big banging on the door and screaming and you know what that meant because Germans never rang doorbells. And my mother went down and they said, draus, draus, and there was an armed truck outside with other people in it. And my mother said, could you come back another time? My, my child is sleeping. And they thought she had lost her mind. I mean, that, that wasn't going to fly. And so my parents had to, in the clothes that they wore, my mother got me up, got me dressed, and they put us on a truck and took us to the central station with other people, other Jewish people. And they sent us to a camp called Vesterborg. Vesterborg is in the eastern part of the Netherlands. The train at that time, the rails, the, the train tracks, did not go as far as Vesterborg, so we had to get out in a town called Hohalen. This was late at night and we had to walk through the mud and the stuff with the guns trained on us. I was, at that time, six years old. I was with my parents, and when you're with your parents, you have a feeling of security. But I'm sure my parents were scared to death. My parents were separated. I was with my mom and my dad. Men and women were separated. And then they made my parents work, and I was left in the barrack. And my mother always said, don't go near the barbed wire. In Vesterborg, we were, we, we weren't beaten or, or, or killed unless you tried to escape. And we had very little food. You know, the food was scarce. I mean, you got a little water soup and a crust of bread, which wasn't even bread. It was like, like sawdust baked or something. My father had to take a wheelbarrow with, with rocks and move back and forth. It was useless, brainless you know, just to keep the people doing something, you know. So it was one bathroom for 150 people, and there was no hot water. There was a, an open area in the camp. You know, there were barracks, but there was an open area that where they used to put us to count every day because they wanted to make sure that nobody escaped. Rain, shine, hot, cold, we had to stand there. So we went towards uh, France, towards Marseille. But we figured in, in Marseille, in France, we would be fairly safe. And this fellow had a halva factory. He wasn't even Jewish, he was a Greek. And he hid us for a while. But then when the, the Nazis came into France, he said, you know what? Time has run out. You're going to have to leave or they we're all go, going to get killed. My father managed to get hold of his brother who lived in America. He had textile mills in Puerto Rico in the Philippines and in China. And he was trying to arrange a visa for my whole family, for my father and my mother, my two brothers and I, to come to America, even on a visitor's visa, just to escape the Nazis. We decided we have to get to Portugal because uh, from Portugal, there was a boat called the Siboney to go to uh, America. We get to the Spanish border, they stop us, of course. <coughs> And they tell my parents, look, your wife can cross over, the children can cross over to Spain, but you can't because you are of fighting age and you should go and fight with the Belgian army. There's no getting away from it. I don't care how big your family is. And my father said, there's no more Belgian army. What do you want from us? We're just trying to escape from the Nazis. So my father went to Casablanca, Morocco, 
uh, my mother went into Spain. Now Spain was already full of Nazis. We had no real place to stay. We had very little food. We were still in the same clothes that we escaped from Belgium. And then my mother gets a phone call to come to the French embassy, which she did. And they told her, send your husband a cable. Say the children are very sick, come immediately. And she sent one every day, the children are worse, please come, you must come immediately. Finally, on a sympathy visa, they gave my father permission to come to uh, Portugal. We get to Portugal, and we were told that there's a boat leaving for America in a couple days. We were on our way to America. We were going to be free. We weren't going to any Nazi concentration camp. The trip was supposed to take six days. I think it took something like seven or nine days because of the storm and everything. And the storm was brutal. The boat is going up and down and sideways. And, and I was going, wee, and I was rolling with the boat and having the greatest time of my life. And the captain said to his men, look, look, here's a sailor for you. We landed at Ellis Island. We thought, in America, Americans, everything good in America. Put us in a room, a doctor comes in. He had a super, very superficial look at us, and he says, it's a miracle you got away from the Nazis, it really is. But I have some bad news for you. We're only allowed to let a certain amount in, and we're already over the quota. You have to go back to Europe. And there's a boat leaving in about a week. My mother bursts out crying. She's crying, we're crying. But my father always kept his cool. apartment, kind of honkered down. Dad kept them at the same job. Then we got a three by five card saying you have to move to some other address. And we just assumed because our apartment is a very nice apartment that some Nazi wanted our apartment. Well, we went to the other place and it was run down, it was nasty, it wasn't clean, it wasn't very nice. But we had no choice. We had to go there. And imagine our surprise when we came into the apartment there was already another family living there. And we couldn't figure out what was going on. But they had the same experience. They had to move in there too. And shortly afterwards, there was another family came in, same thing. Even after the war, I never heard the word ghetto until I came to the United States in 1947. But we were actually being moved into the ghetto. But they didn't grab us, they didn't truck us. We actually walked into the ghetto ourselves. Almost immediately, it became horrible. Very little food. People were getting beaten on the street. People were getting shot on the street. People were being hanged on the street. My dad was cautioned. Somebody said, you have a seven-year-old son. You better get him out of town, is what he was told, because there was going to be a roundup of children. And my dad found a safe house out of town hired a railroad worker to take me there. And we're walking down the street, right in front of us, a truck pulled up. Germans dumping, jumping off the back of the truck. I was the first child taken at, the, at that roundup. And the Nazis and their collaborators, because there were a lot of people who were not German, who were doing their dirty work also, went into the buildings, grabbed the children, brought it down, put them on a truck with me. And when the truck was full of children, we were taken to, to a place. And I was in a corral with maybe several hundred other children. I was so happy to see my dad come in in that place, whatever it was. Spoke to the head Nazi. And he saw me before as he walked in. As he walked out, he didn't even look at me. And I thought, I'm dead. If my father can't get me out, no, that's it, I'm done. He came back several hours later talked to the head Nazi again, and this time the head Nazi turned around and walked out, walked away. And my dad looked at me just the way I'm looking at you, and was just like this. And of course, I knew what that meant. I knew where the door was, and I went to the door, left the corral with him, walked out of there. 
And I, as I sit here now, I am convinced that I am the only child of all those hundreds of children who survived. Saturday, I wanted to go to synagogue. Sunday, they took me to church. And that was quite confusing to me because uh, I only knew my, my religion. I knew nothing about Catholicism. But when they heard that I had a good voice, they wanted to put me in the choir. And that's when I said, no, that's not, that's not what I'm going to do. They tucked me in at night in bed and sometimes read a story when I was a kid. All during the war, they took care of me until uh, the psychiatrist or psychologist that followed the kids felt that um, you were not getting the type of education that you needed, meaning no Judaism in your life, really, even though you go to a synagogue, if you don't go to, to, to uh, Cheda, for example, you don't learn anything about the holidays, you don't learn the language of Hebrew. So they put me in an Orthodox boys' hostel. And the Jenkinsons kind of resisted that because we were like family now, and they didn't want to let me go. But they took me finally to this hostel of about 40 boys, boys' hostel, ranging um, up to 20 years in age, I was so young at that point, I really didn't fit into that type of place. There were very few people or guys there my age. I think there was one that was seven and I was eight. I never knew um, when, I, when I would have a visitation from my sister because she lived in London and I lived elsewhere in upper part of England. She would see the conditions that I lived through and said, I'm gonna see if I can get you out of here. But what they found was another hostel, Orthon Orthodox hostel, in another town of England, Northampton. Every Tuesday night, they would call off names for people that were separated to go on transport. Now, I mentioned before that the train tracks from Amsterdam did not go to Vesterbork in 1942, but there were train tracks out of Vesterbork. When it came, my parents turned to be up to the table there was a young German officer, and my mother recognized him because he was my mother's younger brother's boyfriend who lived on the same street. But he had decided to become a Nazi or a Gestapo because he wasn't going anywhere with his life, and he figured if he becomes a Nazi, he figured he was going to improve his lot in life. So he knew my mother, and when my mother and father's turn came to come up to the table, he indicated with his eyes to my mother not to show that she knew him. And my mother caught on. When it came our turn to get to the table, they scratched out our name. Had that not happened, I would not be sitting here because all the other people were sent to Auschwitz. And when we were released, we went back to Amsterdam to our house. We stayed, I think, in New York for a week or two, we kept trying to fight to stay, but we saw we weren't going anywhere. At the end, we had to uh, board a boat called the Ivoron. We went from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and we sailed uh, towards the Philippines. P.S. we land in Manila. Now, you've got to understand, there's a big difference between the Pacific countries and the Atlantic countries. First of all, there were no screens on the windows over there. You had malaria, you had dengue fever, you, you name it, it was there. And you had to sleep with a mosquito net, and that made it even hotter. I mean, a cool day was in the 90s. We were there for already a month, and my father reads in the papers that the Japanese invaded China, and they're heading in the Pacific towards Guam, and the Philippines was in the way also. <clears throat> my father said, you know what? This is this terrible. We're going into another war. So my father said, we have to prepare. We will not be able to escape. We were started, Japanese came in, and they rounded up all the so-called Caucasians and everybody, and they put us into a prison camp 
called Santa Tomas, St. Thomas in English. We were all there. It was hot as a dickens. We had very little food. One day we were all sitting in a tent, and my father sees a Japanese officer outside, and he's talking in English to somebody. He waited till they were finished, and my father quickly runs out of the tent, and he, my father bows to him, and he says, may I have a word with you, sir? Japanese officer turns around, my father bows again to him very low, and he says, I don't know why you're, you're keeping us here. We're not at war with Japan, we're not Americans. We're just Belgians, we're just passing through. So the Japanese officer looked at him and says, let me have your passports. The father gives him the passports, comes back a few days later, and he says, calls my father Abi. He says, Abi, I want to tell you something. First of all, never lie to me again because you're going to be in very big trouble if you do. My father said, I'm not lying to you. He said, you escaped from Belgium. You escaped the Nazis. You're not just passing through. So he said, yeah, but we're passing through. You know, maybe we'll stay in Manila. Maybe we'll go somewhere else. He said, look, Abi, we'll make a deal with you. We're going to let you and your family go on one condition. We have a factory full of bristles. You are going to be responsible for cleaning all Japanese weapons. You're going to be our ally. You're going to be our friend. We started hiding after that, and we went down into a basement below a factory floor. It was a big, heavy machine. There was a scuttle, just an opening to this area down below with a heavy machine on top. It was so good that initially there were about five, seven people there, and then as more people needed a place to hide, it became 10 or 15 and 25 and 50. And when it got to be about 70 or more left, or more, we realized there was so much food that had to be brought down there and so much uh, human waste that had to come out. And even at a whisper level, there was so much commotion that there was no longer, it was no longer a safe place. And so we left there and we decided to hide in plain view. And what we did is we got false identification papers indicating that we're not Jews. Well, my dad, early on during the war, I guess he must have been in Lvov, went to see a physician. <clears throat> and he said, my, and my dad, he's a good looking man, but he had a generously endowed schnoz. And he said, you see this? This is my death warrant. Give me a rhinoplasty. Common name was a nose job. And the doctor said, I would love to. No, I mean, apparently they were friends, but I can't bring a Jewish person into the hospital. It's forbidden. So my dad said, yeah, if you don't, not only will I die, but my wife is solely dependent upon me. She'll die also. The doctor says, you know I'm your friend. You know I would like to do it. I just can't do it. And finally, my dad played his ace card, which was, I have a seven-year-old son. If you don't at least try, a seven-year-old child will die, and you'll have that on your conscience forever. That was more than a doctor was willing to sustain. My dad went to his house, and with a bottle, half a bottle of vodka, that was a sole anesthetic. My dad actually held, held a pan where blood and shards of bone or grizzle came out of his nose handed the doctor some tools because the doctor was there by himself. His appearance was so changed that people who knew him would then recognize him. It was dreadful because as a cosmetic surgery, it was a disaster. This part of the nose was largely missing. This part was flailed out. He looked like an old beat up boxer, but perfect for what he wanted to do. He didn't look Jewish anymore. And in order to finish the trans transition, he went into the bathroom as a brunette and came out as a blonde. And so the rest of the war, he was able to socialize with Nazis and hang around with Nazis. Nobody suspected. What happened to my parents was totally kept from me until 1942, 
when I received a postcard from the International Red Cross telling me that your parents were murdered and in Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland. And uh, all my prayers for the parents suddenly stopped. And I couldn't believe myself that I could stop saying a prayer for my, my grandparents, who basically brought me up because my parents were working all the time. I was very sad, and I took that very, very hard. And there were, I had nightmares from it. I dreamt that uh, I was drowning all the time, had to go to a psychiatrist to understand these dreams, and I was told that it's not your fault that if you're feeling this way. You have to understand that you were a child and you were taken away from your parents, and that creates trauma. And trauma has a severe consequences, and usually you have to be told how to live through those traumas, that they are normal and they are manageable. I can still see my mother with her arm stretched out as we were taken, marched down the stairs where the trains were. That memory is burnt into my mind. While we were in Vesterbork, my mother's youngest brother was walking down the street and a woman approached him. She was working for an attorney. She said, there's a Dutch guy who is in cahoots with the Germans. He is selling a paper called a Speer. A Speer is like a, a stop, you know, it's a German word. And that'll keep you from being sent east because the Germans had us believe that when people were being transported from Westerbork, they were just going to east for hard labor. They were taking people on gurneys, they were taking babies, they were taking elderly, really hard labor. He says, well, what is this all about? She says, well, he, he charges 120,000 guilders, and 120,000 guilders is like $120,000. So he came home and he said to my grandfather, he said, so-and-so, I found out, you know, you can do this and that. And my grandfather said, let's figure this out. We have 11 people times 120,000. That's millions. Now think about that. Somebody comes up to you and says, for a million dollars, I'll give you a paper that'll save your life. But you have no proof. You have no proof. You know, he could have kept the money for himself. He could have turned us into the Germans and say this Jew didn't follow the rules. We'd be dead in any event. Or he could have done the right thing. We did get to spare. He did the right thing. So. He was in cahoots with the Germans, so he kept some of the money, and the Germans got some of the money. Other people, in retrospect, my grandfather told us that it could have done the same thing, but were suspicious and did not do it. And they're no longer, they didn't survive, they were murdered. And there were not many Jews left. There some were in hiding, like Anne Frank, and most of them were already murdered in Auschwitz and Sobibor. Because of the spare, that when we were in Vesterborg the first time, just my mom, dad, and I, we got to go home. And then the Germans eventually took over our businesses, and they sent us with my grandparents back to Vesterborg again, and the spare got us out again. And one day, we're walking, and my father said, you know, something just doesn't feel right, doesn't seem right. He had just that inner sense and it wasn't more than a few minutes later, boom, trucks went rolling by us, must have been 50, 60 trucks full of Japanese soldiers, and they all jumped off the trucks. They surrounded not only us, but all the other people that were walking on the uh, boulevard. They were looking for uh, uh, people who were spying on them or who were uh, enemies of the Japanese empire. Across the street is a garbage truck. And there are two people there, and they go to my father like this, you know. It was too late. The Japanese had us all surrounded. Tell you how brave these Filipinos are. One of them went running through the crowd. He grabbed my, my two brothers and me, and he said to my father, I can't save you, 
but I can, we can help try to save the kids. And my father said, take them, take them. They grabbed us and they threw us right into the garbage truck. Soldiers are looking everywhere for people, you know, and they start to go to the garbage truck. It smelled so bad, they said, oh, leave it, leave it, you know. They didn't know that we were hiding in there. They grabbed my father and they took him to the worst prison camp that they had because they knew he knew something and they were going to torture him to death till, till they got the information out of him. When the Japs got the people that they wanted to, including my father, the garbage truck took off, took us home, and my mother opens the door and she says, oh my God, you smell so bad and where's your father? What happened to you? We're completely lost without, the, uh, without our dad. We hear the door, key in the door. My father walks in, he says, my gosh, how did you get away? How did you get away? He said, ah, easy. They put him in a cell by himself because they were really going to work him over. And my father took out his cigarettes and he showed it to the guard and he said, open up, I give you the whole cigarettes. Jap soldier went crazy. He said, wait till night, but you have to run, okay, okay? And my father said, yes, yeah, sure, like he was going to run right through the Japanese army out there. They would have killed him in two minutes. So it came nightfall. My father shows him the cigarettes. He opens up the cell door and he says, run. My father says, sure, right. He gives him the cigarettes. He walks out and he's waving to all the Japanese soldiers. You know, he learned a couple words and he's waving it. And he was walking. He said he was so scared, but he just kept walking till he got to a jungle area. Then he ran through and he came to our house. Hanging around with some, with some Nazi who was moaning and groaning and complaining that he had this two-room suite of offices in Nazi headquarters building, which he never didn't have a need for, but he was forced to keep on paying rent. My dad, in a very nonchalant way, said, well, I got a little factory, which he did not. We can use that space. It was in the tallest building in Poland. The top two floors were occupied by the Luftwaffe, the Air Force and the floor, 14 floors down below, where it was a 16-story building, were by these headquarters of various German companies. And we were on the 13th floor. For the next two years, my mother and I hid in a closet off the private office in this two-room suite of offices. And dad would come and go, but always walk the stairs, not the elevator, so people didn't see him that often. And, and he would bring in food because that office was supposed to be vacant. At night, on Saturday, Sunday, we'd crawl out of the closet, but we always had to stay below the window line so people would never see us. We, thank goodness there was heat, 24 hours, seven days a week, and we could open the window, it got too hot, could open the window just about this much for ventilation. But, not, but no more. So from the street, it always looked like the windows were closed. We were in our closet and the two rooms through the offices for two years. Surprisingly, nobody ever looked at our closet in two years' time. Until the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, we could hear it, we could smell the smoke, but we couldn't see it because our windows were facing a different direction. We could see the Nazis, the Germans, lining up troops and marching towards the ghetto. The tanks going towards the ghetto. So we're in a closet. The Polish people rose up. Uh, we were f found by an air raid warden. The only person I ever looked at in that closet was forced to go down into the basement, into the bomb shelter. About a day or so into the bomb shelter, a huge artillery shell penetrated the entire building and didn't explode. It had exploded, it would have vaporized us. And so we went to another bomb shelter because we the thing could explode any time. We arrived in Krakow. And we're always accustomed to avoiding people, to hiding, etc. 
And all of a sudden, a, a group of people show up, and it turns out they were Polish resistance people who knew about my dad, and they were waiting for us. And then they took us to a safe house, and for the next four months in Krakow, we were in a Polish resistance, underground resist, resistance house. On the main street, right above the store, it was like an apartment above the store. That was our hiding place. My father's side of the family had already been murdered, totally wiped out in Sobibor and Auschwitz. We all were sent to Vitel, my mother's side of family. Vitel is a town in France. It's a spa town. They have Vitel water. And I can't begin to tell you how, how lucky we were. We were so, so lucky. Well, the day I was liberated was like any other day. You know, we were in this, in this building, and what we could do is we could see through the curtains out the window, but we could never pull the curtains aside. Then one day after uh, a terrible bombing, the thing stopped, it got quiet for a while. And my oldest brother said again to my brother Leon and I, let's go over to the uh, church down the road. We can climb up the steeple and we can look, maybe we can see what's going on in parts of Manila. What I noticed was the Nazis going in one direction. And that was strange. And I saw trucks and tanks going in the same direction. And then there were met less and less and less, and there were none. The whole 1st Cavalry Division across the river, ready to cross over. They had their pontoon boats, they had their tanks, they had their trucks, thousands of soldiers. They were crossing over. And so somebody said something, and they looked outside, and they said, hmm, no Germans. And somebody, a very courageous person, went maybe to a corner, looked at the intersection, no Germans in this way, no Germans in this way. Maybe we're liberated, but we weren't sure. And with that, we see the first tank come through, big American flag on it, and my mother starts crying, and we're crying. A day or two later, we saw somebody in a strange uniform. It was a Russian, in a Russian uniform. That's how we knew we were liberated. I mean, the American tanks came and the soldiers came. And they were all so handsome and they were well-dressed. We were not. Now, liberation is not what Hollywood holds, holds it out to be. There's no dancing, there's no joy, etc. You know what you deal with? Where's my next meal? Where do I sleep from now on? The doctor says to us, who are you? What happened? What are you doing here? And my parents tell them this story. And he made sure that we had food, they brought another doctor over to examine us. I was yellow from uh, uh, the dengue fever and the malaria and jaundice and everything. My two brothers were also quite sick. And one of the soldiers, he gave me fruit and gum and candy. I had never seen gum or candy. And he said, I have a little girl like that at home. <laughs> it was a wonderful day. But just think about this now. You're liberated, but what are you liberated to? You're liberated from the Germans. You're liberated from oppression behind barbed wire, but you have no place to go. And then you find out that your whole family's been murdered. My dad's family, he had two brothers in New York, a brother, sister in Argentina. He had a brother and sister in Poland, plus us. My mother's family, what was left at the end of the war, you're looking at it. We were just, as, just my mother and I were, that's all that was left of her family. There were 180,000 Jews living in the Netherlands. 102,000 were murdered. When the war ended, um, I was uh, still, still in England. I wanted to go to work in this machine shop. My sister said, no, you're going to the United States. And we have family there. And I ended up working for NASA. It was exciting. It was joyful. How do we have emuna? How do we have belief? How do we have faith in a God? after a holocaust. If there's a God who can make the world better, where is he when we need him to?
Do we choose to have faith, belief in a God after a Holocaust? Because at the end of the day, belief, faith, is a choice. The reason we can live here today as proud Jews is because our parents and our grandparents and the generations who came before us, when they were asked, do we choose faith, Eli Wiesel and others said, yes, we choose faith. I think the role that faith played in the survivor stories was constantly just reminding themselves that God is always with them, even though they might be scared and even though they're going to have to, you know, go through their things on their own, they're always going to have God in their hearts. I think that having faith is important during, was important during the Holocaust for the now survivors because if they didn't have faith to get them through or hope to help them get through, then they might not be here today because faith gives you motivation. And if they didn't have that, then they might not have fought as well as they did. When you guys take what you're learning now, when you take these stories, when you take the faith that these amazing people have had despite what they've been through, and you share that with others, you share this light, you create more light, you create more positivity in a world that's often very dark. My family and I were in Auschwitz, on the ground, and we had a Polish guide. We stayed in a little circle, and two young men, Germans, came and said to us, why are you saying all this to these people? You know it didn't happen. You could see steam coming out of our ears. The Polish guide never missed a beat. He looked at him and he says, you know, I helped build this camp. I was a carpenter. I saw what happened here, and you're telling me it didn't happen? Well, these guys walked away, never said a word. They didn't even look back. They knew they were just beat. Be grateful, be thankful that you don't have to worry about where your next meal is coming from, where no one's looking to throw you in a gas chamber, where no one's looking to kill you. Lead with love. When a, somebody comes from out of the area that you don't know, or is a different color or a different religion. There's no reason not to get to know them and not to like them and make them feel comfortable. It can happen to you, it can happen here. For gosh sakes, get involved in politics, even at your youthful ages. You can volunteer in political campaigns, support the good people, resist the not good people. You know what, the German people enabled Hitler by just by not opposing it. Remember, it can happen here, it can happen now, it, it can happen today or tomorrow. Today we interviewed Alan Hall. I was in awe of his story. One thing I'm gonna take from the interview is his philosophy on how you should live your life and his like view on the world. As an example, we didn't have an education and yet he had like three different amazing professions. I think after hearing the interviews and hearing the survivors speak, I think a main issue is just not to be ignorant about what's going on in the world because it's so easy to just dismiss problems that you know are going on but that don't necessarily affect you personally, even if you know that they're affecting millions of other people and that they're really bad. Thank you for opening up to me and although you had to relive all those moments, I want you to know that means a lot to me for telling me everything that you had to go through, and it shows me how bad World War II really was. I learned that people have different stories, and it's not ju it didn't just happen in Europe, but it happened all over the world. It's very important to learn about like the Holocaust and learn things from the survivors so that history doesn't get repeated. I think it would be very useful to show these videos to people in the future and use them for educational purposes because this has basically their entire experience in the Holocaust and it'll show future generations how they felt and what happened exactly. So instead of learning directly from a textbook, we would learn from someone who actually went through it and you would know how they felt. Feeling inspired, changed, moved by the words said by the survivors and how I got the experience to meet a survivor in person 
and for them to share their story with me was truly inspiring. How can I be useful and what can people do to make a difference in this life? Takum Olam, if you know that phrase, uh, is what I practice. What can you do to make life better, healthier?